Anila, what did we talk about in this episode? Oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Bring it as it is. <laughs> no, this is very candid. No worries. All okay, right. I'll start and then okay, you're, let's you're do it off. again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I was not ready for that. Um, okay. Anila, what did we talk about in this episode? Well, today in this episode, I shared my mental health journey,、mm-hmm. um, as well as how I turned my pain into my purpose and am helping other people on their mental health journeys take control of things like hair pulling, skin picking, and nail biting.、Yeah. We also talked a lot about growing up in America as、mm. a first generation child,、mm. um, if that's of interest. Yeah, definitely. And then Anila also turned her energy into a product called Kin. So you can find more information by listening to this episode. Welcome to Chai with Ping. This is Ping Robert. In this podcast, I cover underrepresented and personal stories. Join me with a cup of chai and take a listen. Right. So. Welcome to Chai with Ping. My name is Ping Robert. Today we have a very special guest.、Um, she is the president and the co-founder of Habit Aware. And later we're gonna talk about what she invented with her、um, co-inventors. And she founded this company because she wants to、um, overcome. Trichotillomania is a hard word. It's a body-focused repetitive behavior.、Um, so you might hear more people talking about hair pulling. So that's a habit. And then、um, she she's here to talk about it. So let's welcome Anila Idnani. Thank you, Ping, for having me. It's <laughs> exciting to be here. And yes, it's a hard word to say, trichotillomania. It's also a hard hard condition to deal with, but. Um, knowing that there's so many people out there with it, I am excited to share my story in hopes that it helps someone else listening feel a little bit less alone and feel a little bit more hopeful that they can take control. Absolutely.、Um, actually, in previously, I had an episode talking to Bree about trick. So for sure, trick mania. So if you want to hear more, you can definitely link to the link will be in the episode notes. But today, Anila is gonna talk about her own story. So Anila, can we talk a little bit about your background first? Yeah. So I'm an Indian American. I'm a first generation. I grew up in New York. My parents moved to Queens, New York, in 1975. With a suitcase and five hundred bucks, and they came here for kind of the "quote unquote" American dream.、Uh, my dad was in like a a business student, and my mom had a dental degree, and took six years to finally pass the New York State dental license exam, and then started practicing here. So they came here for a better life. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Long Island, New York,、okay. in a neighborhood where, you know, we weren't we weren't financially supposed to be there.、Um, my parents wanted us to get the best education, and so we lived in a town where the public school education was just, you know, award winning, and it was hard because I didn't feel like I fit in. <laughs> I, I grew up for most of those years feeling very. Um, doubtful in my own self、um, and my own abilities because I, you, you know when you grow up around just people that don't represent who you are and 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 have a whole lot more than you, you wonder like what's wrong with me, right? Yeah.、Um, and so it was it was it was not to not to say that it wasn't like also fun because I had a good group of friends,、um, but it was it was you know. That was that was my reality back. <laughs> <laughs> When you say that you didn't fit in, is it because of race? I think race definitely played a role. Like in, it was it was interesting. In even in middle in even in elementary school, there was already like the Indian kids hanging out with the Indian kids, the Asian kids hanging out with the Asian kids, and then you had all of the the white kids.、Mm. You know, when you know we were we were like a minority of like a handful of.、Um, so yeah, I think. I think race played a role. I think、um, you know social class or finances played a role,、yeah. um, and then just lack of understanding. Like it's the eighties, you know, so you don't really know much about other people's cultures. Whereas now today,、yeah. 
I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old and we just celebrated Diwali with all of their classmates, right? Like, oh, wow. like explaining different people's cultures and religions yeah. and stuff. So, um, and I think, and honestly, I think growing up the way that I did impacted the fact that I try to initiate some of this stuff in our school, but I see it happening in a lot of other schools as well. Definitely. I think the society right now, I'm, it's it's more inclusive i think it's it's almost like a banner that all a lot of schools are taking out saying that we need to be diverse like and we welcome diversity and we want to be inclusive to to students and yeah i can i can definitely see that trend so while growing up was a so you you also talk about like you're still navigating it's like you're not fully indian not fully american where was there any examples or experience that you can share with us it's like when were those moments that you kind of like like I don't know what to do or this is struggling yeah yeah I think it's just something that you I can't think of anything in particular in the moment like no one ever calls you out for being you know a different culture but it's just this it's the subtleties that that you feel which I think is what makes it so hard to define racism and to and to for people to acknowledge that maybe they are racist because people think that oh because I don't say bad things about other people I'm not racist but actually it's inaction that is also racism right um or it's ignoring people that's also racism um so there's really like no one thing or you know big bullying moment or anything that that really uh, got to me it was just this knowing that I'm different um, and for better or for worse you know I saw other friends embrace their culture and learn birth not the I'm dancing and you know go on into college to do uh, Bhangra dance competitions and and you know sp- be able to speak in Hindi to their grandparents whereas my parents feared that I wouldn't learn English if they spoke Hindi at home you know now we know that the young ages is when you're supposed to learn new languages. But again, we didn't have that information back then. So it was, it was, there was nothing, there was no one big moment. Um, Yeah. But I I feel like when you're talking about, you know, dancing or Hindi. So how was it like when your parents were raising you? Did they speak only in English or? They spoke. Yeah. They spoke Hindi and Sindhi also, which is Mm -hmm. the, the region that we're from um, to themselves, like kind of like secret language. (laughs) And my sister being more curious, picked it up a little bit more than I did. And to be honest, I can probably understand some of what people can say, but I'll have to respond in English. Um, But yeah. And, and, you know, it was kind of just like two worlds, like Monday through Friday was school with, you know, with like the you know the town and then the yeah. weekends was all my indian community aunts and uncles like going to people's houses like big parties um where all the kids would just hang out in the basement and all the parents would hang out upstairs and just you know and yeah. or and going to um we call it satsang or the center like our religious uh uh temples yeah um yeah so is it is satsang for Sikhs or yeah yeah yep. okay got yeah. it got it yeah. oh okay and is it common for kids to learn to dance as well to learn to dance yeah I think it was yeah I had a bunch of friends that took dancing not everyone though yeah and not you not me <laughs> no okay yeah. but I I feel like it it feels to me that it's important for you to find that identity in those two things yeah I think it's definitely something that. I think I'm trying to impart on my children because I didn't have it. And it's nice to have two kids that are interested and eager to learn about because yeah. it's a good opportunity for me to read about our yeah. culture and um, our gods. And, you know, I mean, we eat Indian food at home. We try to cook it. Not so, not so well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think also for me, a lot of my own self-doubt issues that we're kind of talking about also are rooted in mental health. Like I, I had, social anxiety right Mm -hmm. but at the time it was just oh she's anila is shy you know again we didn't know so yeah so i wasn't gonna raise my hand and say i want to go to dance lessons because that was not like something that i 
that I could do in a yeah. sense, right? Like that was, that would have been me putting myself way out there, which I didn't have the, the, the heart for uh, yeah. th- when I was that young. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was also imagining because you mentioned that um, you started pulling your hair and then we can kind of just diving in there in the, in the TED talk. So listeners, um, Anila's TED talk is called Overcoming Trichotillomania, the Power of Awareness. And it's the TED talk in Fargo. Is Fargo mm-hmm. a university or city or? It's a yep city in North Dakota. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you're interested, please give it a listen. I think it was a very powerful story. So you mentioned that your dad has cancer. Can we talk about that part? How it got triggered? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I was as a kid, a thumb sucker, and then I used to twirl my hair at bedtime. And then um, around age 12, I started kind of pulling out my hair as a as just like a coping mechanism for stress. And I think, Mm -hmm. I think there's some, um, so trichotillomania is the mental health condition. There's not enough research, but I believe just in looking at my own life, I think Mm -hmm. there's a hormonal component. So it was around puberty. And then when I was in freshman year of high school, my dad fell sick with cancer. And so this hair pulling became even more of a mechanism for me to cope with all that was happening um you know the stress of school the stress of watching my dad and being kind of not able to do anything um and I just started pulling more and more and more and I didn't really know who to talk to or what it was or you know that it was a mental health issue at that time so I just hit it I thought I don't need to give anyone another reason for thinking I'm weird or, you know, making fun of me or just giving people another reason to make me feel lesser than, right? So I just hate it. I didn't tell my mom because she had enough to deal with, um, with my dad being in the hospital so much. And, um, and my sister by that time was in college and didn't really have that as close a connection to her as I do now. Um, So yeah, I hid for 20 plus years and then my dad passed away when I was senior in high school. And then I, you know, I just kind of continued sort of hiding and, and trying to find other methods to release the pain, but mostly it was just pulling out my hair. Is it hair on your head or any other parts? Um, Yeah, mostly my eyebrows and my eyelashes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I, I also wonder, did you and your parents talk about when your dad had cancer? Like, how did you cope with that part? What yeah. Was the attitude? It was just, you know, prepare for the best kind of s- scenario. Like, hope, just pray and hope and, you know, follow the doctors, do what they say kind of thing. Um, it was just, it was hard because you just, you have, you put your trust in the people that, spend their lives studying and treating and but they don't know (laughs) they don't know right it's just it's all one big life is all one big experiment I guess and it was again like 80s 90s I mean cancer is still a thing today right so it's just it's I think it's just a crapshoot like who treatments work for right it's Um, hard it's hard it's hard yeah yeah and so you mentioned that your mom would take care of your dad in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And so does it mean that you will stay home alone? All by yourself? Um, yeah, I would stay at friends' houses. Uh, I would hang out with Indian family friends, basically. Um, I mean, they really were, you know, we call them aunt and uncle, auntie and uncle, because they were our extended, our extended family, especially yes. when our parents come came to the U.S., like they moved to the to Queens where all this whole community of Cindy's was living. And then as all the families kind of started making more money and, and doing better in business and getting more settled in, then they moved to Lo- to Long Island. And so that's sort of how we kind of followed and created community. Um, so, yeah, so we had a lot of good people around us um, to, to watch over me, to help my mom, uh, to help my dad. But like, I don't know, it was, it was, it's like my dad would set up his fax machine in the hospital room because 
he was like, this is not, he's, he was doing his work, you know, like he's just like, this is not going to stop me uh, kind of mentality. Were you close to that? Um, not as much as I would have hoped. Looking back, like a typical yeah, Asian. I think not it's to like say. A, <laughs> no. I don't. I mean, I think we were just. I think part of. I think yeah. I mean, maybe you know. I don't know if it's cultural or what, but you know, we didn't really talk that much. Like, if that makes sense, it's like. So I don't think I was very close to him, but I feel like I've gotten closer to him. <laughs> weird um in a sense because i always talk with him i always like pray with him that kind of thing wow yeah and how long was your dad um sick before he passed about four out? years four years all right wow that's definitely tough yeah it's is any it's any way very difficult to see a loved one passing away slowly like that yeah. 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 It's pretty, it's pretty hard, but I mean, and it took me like what, 20, nearly 30 years to really like make peace with it. Um, mm. But what I've come to realize is that you just kind of have to have faith that everything is happening for a reason. And, and to be honest, it did like in a weird way, you know, without, my dad being sick, I never would have met my best friend who was the daughter of one of his doctors. And then years later, she's the one that introduces me to my husband, Samir, and who is now my business partner, you know? So like, it's just, you have to kind of, look, you can either live in fear or you can live in faith. And so yeah. you kind of have to trust that things are happening behind the scenes to help you get to where you're supposed to be in life. Yeah. Can you tell us more, like, how you met your best friend? Like, how does that happen? Do, yeah. Is it common to meet a doc doctor's family member? Yeah. Um, well, in the Indian community, probably, because a lot, of, a lot of Indians are doctors. And when my dad got sick, you know, it was, um, it was, it was, it was all community, right? It was, where, which hospital should we go to talking with most of our Indian Sindhi community on Long Island was more business oriented, but we had um, a couple of families, you know, just like different areas, but one of them was uh, Punjabi, which we were kind of talking about earlier, um, half Punjabi, half Sindhi, and so they had another Punjabi family friend, which wasn't in the Sindhi community, but they hung out with and said, oh, you know, so-and-so is a doctor. You should just meet with him. Um, he wasn't on like his, my dad's direct care team, but it was more like a, a informal conversation of here's what's going on. Here's some of my blood work, whatever. And that all happened over dinner at their house um, where all our families came and I met this girl who became my best friend. And, um, yeah, and it was just the town right next to right next to where I lived, and so we literally were a five minute drive from each other. And in all through high school, we were just really good buddies. Wow, wonderful! That's so cool. And so you mentioned that your dad passed away when you were a senior, so you were in high school. Yeah. And then later on, where did you go, and how did you establish your career? Yeah, I was kind of all over the place. So I studied accounting um, right out of right out of high school because I really wanted to go into business too. It was just what I knew and what I, I mean, I even used to play office as a child. So I studied accounting. I went into uh, audit for a few years. And then to be honest, a lot of other stuff was happening in my life. I think I was still feeling lost from the loss of my dad and, um, I just kind of fell into a deep depression. And so I, I left accounting. I wanted to, I was trying to seek more fulfillment or a little bit more, um, a little bit more feeling like I was making a difference. Uh, so I left and I traveled for a little bit and came back with the decision that I wanted to, to marry my desire to be creative with my desires for business and went into advertising. <laughs> Uh, and so I did advertising for a really long time. By this time, I had met Samir, and we had gotten married, and we had moved to Minneapolis. And then that's where I was working in advertising. He was working in his uh, corporate strategy. 
And then, you know, I was pregnant at the time. And again, like I said before, hormones affect my hair pulling. And one day as I'm going into the bathroom to get the black eye pencil to kind of cover up the, the patch that I had made, um, he just squinted at me and said, where are your eyebrows? And that was, that was it. That was finally after 25 plus years, I told someone that I pull out my hair and in the weeks after that, you know, we're sitting on the couch and I'm pulling and Samir just gently grabbed my hand. And that was kind of that aha moment of, Oh, I wish I just had something that could tell me because it's such a trance like behavior where it's your automatic brain. It's on autopilot. It's just doing its thing. And you don't realize it until your whole keyboard is filled with hairs or, you know, if you're a skin in doing, if you're engaging in skin picking, which is a sister condition where like, you know, you may pick at your pimples or, or create even bigger scabs than that, where you don't realize it's happening until the damage is done in a sense. Um, and so that's, that's the company that we started to kind of help people build this power of awareness so that you could take control. When do you usually pull your hair or like, how is that setting? Does it make a difference where you are? Yeah. Um, where do you usually pull your hair or what kind of plays will trigger that more? Yeah, that's a great question. So for 20 years, I did not know the answer to that until I started, um, as we were testing the first device that we were building, I had to handwrite because obviously we didn't have that feature yet. Um, all it could do was tell when my hand was playing with my eyebrows, like it just did. Um, and then I would just handwrite down the date and the time and some notes and from that, I finally figured out it was always while I was working, like during the day, or even as a kid, I had this habit of staying up really late and reading or writing or planning my future, which is like as a 10 year old, I don't know what I was thinking, like, I'm going to go to this college and these are the courses I'm going to take. Like it was, it was kind of intense. Um, so it was always work, stress related to work, and then late at night. And so now armed with that information, I have my strategies. So when I'm working, I always have water nearby because that, to me, that's like a good replacement strategy where if I start feeling my fingers, uh, my hands playing with my eyebrows or eyelashes, I'll just take a glass of water, do a couple of deep breaths, and then get back to work. Because um, really these behaviors are all about soothing mechanisms and rebalancing energy you know your mind is is anxious or tired or bored and trying to get back to equilibrium and that's your these restless hand movements are sort of that signal to you like hey i need a moment of me and so if you can give yourself that moment then you can learn to take control and and reduce the hair pulling the skin picking the nail biting um so that so really i figured out it was while at work sitting at a desk or late at night sitting on the couch working. Yeah, yeah. And all, I, I feel it's almost combined with thinking process, like the thought process and all that, trying to figure out a solution and then kind of trigger your polling. But you seem very knowledgeable about your situation. Did you talk to a counselor or a therapist to find out all that? Yeah, well, not to find out that stuff, but... As we started building the habit aware device, we brought in psychologists who understand trichotillomania, dermatillomania, so that's hair pulling and skin picking, the medical terms for those, um, to really, you know, make sure we were on the right track with this idea of awareness. So the bracelet itself, you train it for the, the behavior that you do for that restless hand movement. And then it sends a vibration when it senses a match. And that vibration is essentially a cue for you to respond in a healthier way. So it's really the, the habit, um, like the cognitive behavioral triangle, essentially. It's your mind, um, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, right? Oh, sorry, <laughs> your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. So your thoughts um, cause you to feel a certain way and then cause you to react in a certain way. So if you can break that cycle of reaction by giving yourself that moment of pause to think about what's actually happening. What am I thinking about? What am I feeling? And deal with it. Then you don't wind up pulling or picking automatically, right? So it's, it's all about this idea of 
taking control, building awareness, and pausing to actually respond with intention, which is hard to do in the moment because, you know, you got work to do, you got emails, you got your kids, you got this, you got that. And, and we always put us, ourselves, like back burner, back burner, back burner Mm -hmm. until you kind of pop like a balloon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So like, when was the the time that you started thinking about inventing King? Because you mentioned Samir kind of took your arm away mm-hmm. from your face. And then was that a moment that you started thinking about inventing something to help yourself? Yeah, then we started looking online to see if anything existed and we couldn't find anything. And we were kind of like, well, why not us? Like, why not try this? And so we are living in Minneapolis. When we moved here, we started going to meetups, <laughs> meetups, just because I was super interested in the intersection of advertising and technology. So I was going to meetups for that stuff and then just started making friends in the community that way. And so when I came up with the idea, I just started asking those friends and telling them, hey, this is the thing that I do. Um, st- So not only having to tell them about my idea, my startup idea, if you will, which is also nerve wracking, um, but also sharing this mental health secret. And it was interesting because the more I shared, the more people would come up to me and be like, I pull out my hair, look at my nails. I, you know, I bite my nails. And so we were quietly just making a list of people that could help us test the device and give us feedback and, and Honestly, the Minneapolis tech community has been so phenomenally supportive of the work we're doing um, in so many different ways that uh, uh, honestly blessed to be in Minneapolis and don't think Habitware would have happened if Samir and I were still living in New York, just the, the way that, that it all kind of organically happened. Does it feel liberating or kind of freeing when you tell, start telling people about Trick? Yeah, I, it didn't click for me until I started telling people, so there's so much fear of judgment. There's so much fear of, you know, telling someone I pull out my hair and them going, ew, that's gross. Why would you do that? Why don't you just stop? But that's not what I was met with. I was met with compassion or I was met with people that say, oh, I don't know what that is, but I do this or, or I, I do it too. And then you realize just how common it is, you know, one in 20 Americans, like that's, that's a lot of people. Um, like just in one, one, you know, go to your Facebook page. Like that means you probably know 20 people, you know, that have it kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's nerve wracking to share that you have these secrets, but I also believe that the secrets are what make you sick because You spend all this time covering up and hiding and, you know, wondering, can, can Ping see that I don't have, you know, or can, can, is someone noticing that I'm pulling in the meeting or whatever it is, right? You spend all this time caught up in, in the disorder and in the, 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 I don't know what the word is. This it's the dis- like despair. The yeah, yeah it's the like zone. Yeah, you're trying to cover up yourself from yeah. revealing a secret to other people, mm-hmm. and then I, I feel there's shame, maybe yep. fear, and fear of rejection because people exactly and judgment and what just like what you said, and you're trying so hard to keep something down, but it's okay. surfacing up, mm-hmm. and it's like oh, it's not just like in your heart or in your body that you can keep. It's literally a a gesture a a behavior that people can see yeah yeah it's all of that everything that you just said and like the more you try to hide it right like you and that's that's where your energy goes that's where your time goes that's where and i don't know it's it's much like you know you have a choice of how you want to spend your time and energy it could be hiding and covering up or it could be actually healing actually putting effort into getting better into understanding when am I pulling, where am I pulling, how am I pulling, uh, what's causing it and then dealing with it. Right. Like, so it's, but they're both, they're both wrought with fear. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That also, you said that you didn't really get in touch with your own therapist. Is there a reason why you didn't have your therapy sessions or. Oh, sorry. You know, I actually answered, I guess in a little bit, 
uh, vague-ish. So with regard to building the device, we, we talked to a lot of psychologists to make sure that people, that we were building habit aware in the right way. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, at the same time, as we were starting to build our company, it was Samir that encouraged me to find a therapist in town that uh, understood these conditions. And I went to her for probably a year. Um, and it was really, really helpful to just have someone to talk to, yeah. um, just have someone to, I don't know, just have someone to help you see things in a different mm-hmm. way, perspective. Yeah. Um, it was, it was like, she was actually the one that was like, go home and write 20 things that, that were good that happened from your father's death. And that's when it clicked for me, like, oh yeah, like that. Yes. That was a really huge, painful part of my life, but Mm -hmm. ultimately it's brought me so much purpose and Mm -hmm. so many people in my life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so like trying to like, just that, that perspective was really, really a gift that she gave me. And then it just kind of got to the point where it felt like I was having coffee with a friend (laughs) And it's just actually a good thing. Like you want your psychologist to be someone that you look forward to seeing and mm-hmm. that the conversation is, is casual and comfortable. But at the same time, I was like, I was in a mentally in a good place and just felt like maybe I didn't need to pay for this anymore. <laughs> um, so, and also just a little bit more open and, and talking with my own friends of yeah. what was really going on instead of the superficial stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Would you recommend therapy to other people? Absolutely. Yeah. I think not just recommend it, but I really believe that just the way that our health insurance company, you know, covers that one physical health checkup a year, they should be covering like quarterly mental health checkups because it all starts with the mind. And if your mind is not right, like the body slowly goes, you know, follows suit. Well said. Yeah, I do agree. And that's also why I'm following up some some other people, some other guests to to cover up more cover up to cover more mental health issues and all that. And thank you, Anila, to bring your stories. Um, so do you want to talk about a little bit about how you invent and start a company and how you're lending with your product, Keen? Yeah. So, you know, once we kind of had the idea, we started trying to build it, which we really couldn't. Um, And then we just started asking around Minneapolis tech community, you know, can you help or do you know someone? And that's slowly how serendipitously we got introduced to John and Kirk, who are our two co-founders in this and who have helped build it from the ground up to from you know a janky prototype that I was wearing a few weeks in to today working on uh, a new completely new product for people with hair pulling skin picking and nail biting backed by uh, an NIH that's National Institute of Health funded research grant so you know in the few years that we've been around we've been really able to help thousands and thousands of people in 60 plus countries use this idea of awareness to break that cycle, break that trance, and then learn to to respond in healthy ways, learn to understand what's really happening, um, which is scary. Like, you know, sometimes you don't want to know what's going on. You just kind of want to deal with whatever. Like, sometimes it's easier um, to just let things be, but the reality is if you really want to get better and if you really want to see improvement in your life, you have to take effort to make the change happen. Um, and so we are for those people who are ready to ready to use the power of awareness to take control and to get their life back and to shift that energy that they were spending hiding into healing and into doing the things that they love to do. So your product is called Keen Two right now, right? Yeah. So our new product is yeah. So the original (laughs) the original Keen came out in 2017, Mm -hmm. and then we got the research grant in 2018. And so our new product, Keen Two, has just launched for pre order. And so that's a culmination of all of the feedback from our Keen family, which is what we call our customers because they are our community. We are their community as well. Um, so feedback from them plus the research grant project that we did uh, to build a holistic solution that integrates more of evidence-based treatments like habit reversal training so that people are not just 
building their awareness, but also practicing and being trained in that response mechanism. Wonderful. Sorry, I'm just writing it down. It's like, yes, so good. Um, why did you name, name it Kin? It's a bracelet, right? Yeah, it's a bracelet. Yeah. Uh, so we named it Keen because it brings you keen awareness. That was kind of the, the the naming the naming idea there. And then the company is Habit Aware because our goal is to help you make you aware of, yeah. you know, people call these habits whether you want to, you know. Um, so that was that was kind of the naming. We just wanted something punchy and short that mm. kind of got to the the goal and the premise, which was keen awareness. Yeah. So for the listener, I'm just going to build out some background because I did some research on Keen and Anila, you're free to join in after I'm <laughs> after I lay that background. So Keen is a product is like a bracelet and um, it gives it can remember your behavior t- patterns. I think the few times that when you use it and then it starts to remind you when you are making the same movement along the day and then it gives you a bi- vibration. Mm-hmm. Is that right? And to remind you and to break that, um, I think just build awareness and also break that habit. Exactly, so yeah. By that time, the, when the vibration kind of start up, then it reminds the customers or clients to to realize that they could probably use a break or do something else to stop that habit. That's exactly it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Yeah, cool. So how has that been going? I mean, how did you start a company, we invented a project and uh, invented a product and then apply for a, a research grant and went to TED, TED Talks? Yeah, I mean, like like I said earlier, a lot of it's, I mean, it's a lot of hard work and a, a, a lot of luck too, just in terms of, um, the people that we've met who have supported our journey, you know, connecting us to other people who, for example, run the, the TEDx Fargo chapter. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, everything has happened kind of, obviously we've worked hard. We've, we've put ourselves out there. We've created a really good product that people are more than happy to share with others who are having these conditions, who are having these issues. Um, and just honestly, I think just the, the way that we approach it. And like I said before, like their community, there are our people, like I, I am one of them before I am a founder of, of the, of a company, right. Because I've dealt with this condition for so long and, and pulled out my hair for so long that I, I get the pain that they're, that people are going through and all we want to do is help. And so I think that just coming at it from that, sorry, coming at it from, from that perspective of our goal is to help advocate for people in this community to help build awareness of these conditions so that when they do share, they are met with compassion. They are met with, Oh, I read an article about that. And, Oh, that's really interesting. Or, you know, rather than that negativity and that judgment. And so, yeah, I mean like building a company is hard. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's not, it's not like all roses, but, but I think with the right team we all work really well together we've all pretty focused on the vision and the mission of what we're trying to accomplish that we've just been 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 lucky to and blessed to be able to do what we're doing and to get the emails in from people that are saying how we're helping them or how we're helping their their 10 or 12 year old kids like that's that's why we do it you know because it, it it feels so good knowing that unlike me who didn't have the help because we didn't know what it was back then. Like we can change the trajectory of people's lives. Absolutely. Yeah. So if the listeners, you want to find the products, you can find it from the, their website. It's called habitaware.com. You can also follow them on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook posts. I think three of them, the handles are the same habit aware. Yes. Yeah. So where can people get your products? Get the King 2. Yeah, right directly on our website at habitaware.com. There's lots okay. more information there on how it works and all the new features. 
Cool. Before we go, do you have any other last thoughts that you want to share with the listeners? Um, yeah, I mean, really just remember that if, well, one, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you for having me, Pink. Um, but I think really just that one thought of, you know, with one in 20 Americans pulling out their hair, picking at their skin, uh, biting their nails, and also then remembering that cultural aspect of, you know, there are certain cultures that are just not as open about this stuff. So, you know, just kind of trying to keep watch, keep an eye for your friends, your loved ones. If it's not you, it is someone you love that's kind of hurting and hiding and, and there is hope for them. And you can find the resources too, to help them and support them on their journey in the same way that you might be going through something like, why not have a friend in that, you know? So Wow. Awesome. So if you want to find more about Nila and her company, Habitware, and her product, Kane, uh, you will be able to find all the links in the episode notes, and I'll put it down there. You can reach out to me directly to a Chai with Ping or also just reach out to Nila. Thank you so much for coming. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Try With Ping. If you think someone will benefit from this episode, don't forget to share with them. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you like my show, you can buy me a chai with small gifts. Details are in the episode notes. Till next time! Do you need a charger? Okay. It's okay, we can cut this. Is that your kid? No, it's my husband. Oh, hi, Samir. This is Ping. You want to say hi? You can't hear. He can't hear, but. Oh. Hi, Ping. Sorry. Hi, Samir. I don't know where the other one is. Um, we have one charger between the two of us. Oh, got um, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um...